Hi, everybody, and welcome to Metaphysical Insights. I'm your host, William Becker, and I have a very special guest on today, Mr. Stephen Lachance. And Stephen is somebody that I have wanted to talk to for years, since the first time I saw him on a TV show. Um, and fascinating person with quite a catalog of books he's written, uh, movies and TV shows he's been in or helped produce or helped write or consult or all of the above on and radio and, and I mean just so much more. And so Stephen, thank you and welcome. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I don't get to do this as much as I used to. So well, it's it's an honor for me to have you on. Um, people in the chat or that come on so you know you can write um, comments and questions and I can highlight them and they show up and maybe we can answer them. Um, we were just talking about difficulty in knowing the answers. So, <laughs> um, I know a little bit about your journey, um, but not a lot. So I guess the question I want to ask first is um, how did you really, what age did you get involved? And what were there, I know one big event, I'm a little rusty on it, but were there lead ups before this? How did this develop into what you do now? And I know it's a loaded big question, so excuse me. Oh, it's a big question. Um, from pass-wise, from uh, early age, um, I think things were going on, and I think things were happening throughout my life, but I always managed to justify them, you know, mm -hmm. um, push them away um, after afterwards, usually. Uh, you know, those, those moments in your life that you think something happens and then you go, no, but that was just this or that. So it's not that when I got to, um, in 2001 is, is when we actually moved into a haunted house, uh, right. unknowingly, <laughs> it's not something I planned. Um, but up to that point, people usually ask me about that point forward, but up to that point, I don't think. I was skeptical at all. I was never really skeptical. It's just, I, I never really gave it much thought. You know, I mean, it, it was what it was. And um, it was just something that I never thought about. I mean, um, as a child, I found out later, much later, um, one of the first places that we lived in as a, when I was a young boy was a, a house that um, was very active. As a matter of fact, my mother used to, this is, this is after I lived through my haunting as an adult. She said that she used to hear uh, footsteps come up the steps and then she would go into my nursery to check on me and find me tucked in um, to my bed. Um, that it would actually tuck the covers in around me. I, I don't know. Um, I do remember at three years old playing with uh, a toy in the living room of my house, um, that house is in particular, and it was a it was a tow truck, and I remember the Christmas tree coming down on me, and I remember getting in trouble because my mother thought that I had rammed my truck into the tree, and I had it, and that stuck with me. And then there was, as I go through my childhood, I remember I had a friend that lived in the wall that I used to talk to through a knot hole. Um, you know, all of the normal kind of things, you know, and then as I grew, you know, things would happen, like I would have dreams about someone before they die, you know, um, that sort of thing. So, but I never really gave it much thought other than it was, that was just the way it was, that was things, you know, um, and that was just how life was. And it, it never really struck me as anything and there was a time right before we moved into the, the major haunted house 
that I was living in a house that I got out of the shower one day and I walked into the kitchen and all the cabinet doors were open. And the kids weren't there. They were, they were at my mother's house because I was actually getting a night out by myself. I was a single dad, so it didn't happen too often. And I remember thinking that was really strange and I closed all the cabinet doors and I'm thinking, well, the kids had to have opened it before they left. It was later that I found out that the house we were living in, there was a, an older woman that lived there before us and she had died. Um, and the kitchen where, where that had happened. And, and I kind of thought, well, that's, that's strange. And I kind of, I kind of pushed it off, you know, and that sort of thing, you know, that you go through life and, you know, things happen to you and then you go, okay, well, this is this, and this is this. And I think you do it sort of as a way to get along. Um, you don't want to think that you're really not as in control of things as you would like to think, I think. <laughs> and I, that was the hardest part for me because by the time that we moved into what, what they now call the screaming house, this house screamed, um, by the time we moved in there, um, I, I was, had been justifying things for quite a while, I guess. And I never really thought of it as anything else than something I, that I would just, that was just odd, or I would just talk away, or as far as the kids went, you know, you get children that are always seeing things and claiming they're seeing things. And I, I you know, and I would just thought with the kids, it was just kids. You know, I had my daughter tell me that um, she would see people standing in her closet talking to her. I mean, this was before the house, even. And so, yeah, I, that kind of thing, I always kind of thought was just kids being kids. You know, I think we, we are taught that as life goes, you know, that um, you say something about uh, a haunting or uh, an occurrence or this person was talking to me or grandma was talking to me. In the case of my daughter, it was my sister who passed away. Um, and you think, well, that's wishful thinking, that's a child's imagination. And what we do to our children, and I've tried to get really this message out that we should listen and not judge so much. Right. And maybe we shouldn't tell them so much that it's their imagination. Maybe we should listen more as an active listener, actively listening and participating less in giving our opinion to them. And I kind of wish I would have done that with mine, because by the time that we moved into the screaming house, um, things started happening there with them, and I didn't believe them, you know. And I'm talking major events, you know. Um, I, I was outside working in the yard one day, and I heard my son screaming inside. And when I got to him, he was um, in a state of uh, shock, shaking, literally shaking. And I can remember asking him what was wrong, and he said that something chased him up from the basement steps. And I went into the full dad thing immediately. You know, I kind of just discounted him. I, I feel really guilty about this now, um, because I fully, fully just kind of pushed it away. And I said to him, I said, you know, um, it's the whole basement monster thing. There's nothing there. It was your imagination. You, what you heard was not what you heard, that sort of thing. Man. All parents do, um, majority. Uh, so I said, well, I'm going to go walk downstairs and I'm going to show you that everything is okay, that there's nothing that you can, you know, uh, worry about. And you could come with me and he wouldn't go with me. So I did the whole dad thing where I'm like, I'm going down the stairs. <laughs> I'm down here and I don't see nothing. You know, I'm, I'm talking in a loud voice. And the truth was, I, I didn't see it. There, I couldn't see anything going on. And it was shortly after that my daughter comes into my room. Now, the boys were in my room already because we had just moved into this house and I was uh, buying, uh, their beds were being shipped in. So they're sleeping with me already because um, the beds, had, that's how fresh we had moved in. And she comes into the room in the middle of the night and says, Dad, um, there's noises um, in my bedroom and the closet keeps opening and closing. And I keep getting up and closing and it opens up again. And I'm scared. Can I stay in here with you? And 
At that point, I have all three kids in one room with me, and I'm thinking, my God, what's going on here? You know, yeah. um, the fact that I was a single father means they had a mother who was out of the picture. Was that that thing? You know, um, was it? The, did they put too much onto the move? You know, they thought the move was going to change their lives somehow. In you know, because I had my youngest son was always wanting us to be like normal families, whatever the hell that meant. I'm not quite sure, but it was always that sort of thing, you know. Um, and I, I, I really didn't know what I did at that point, um, what was going on with them. But I was worried. Um, and it wasn't long after that when things started, the, the train left the track. And uh, I, I, had to leave with them in the middle of the, well, it was about 9 p.m. in the evening. Um, it was before I went on a trip. I was a corporate trader for Hallmark at the time. And so before I would go on a trip, I would always spend time with them playing games and that sort of thing. Um, we were in the living room. I would make them turn all the TVs off and stuff, you know, quality family time. Um, we were getting the board game ready. And, uh, I, it was Monopoly, I can remember. The boys were sitting in front of me, my daughter was, um, in front of the coffee table, you know, like family. We're getting things ready yeah. and getting the board game ready. And I looked up, and I was sitting in the living room, and I looked up, and I could see into the family room, and I could see the kitchen doorway from where I was sitting. And in that doorway was a smoky black figure of a man. And... I looked down and I thought, well, I'm going to look back up and this thing's going to be gone. And when I looked back up, it was still there. And it moved into the middle of the family room, which is fairly in front of me. And then it just kind of dissipated and went away. Now, when I say smoky black figure of a man, it was, it was fluid. It, it like moved within itself. I knew it was a man from the shape. I couldn't see eyes, but I could feel like looking at me it kind of felt like it was and at that point um i realized that the kids the kids were were pretty on board they were they were telling me the truth but i didn't want to scare them because i i had the thought at the moment that i didn't want to be like those families in the middle of the night that go out running and screaming you know i didn't want to be the amityville horror <laughs> kind of movie thing you know <laughs> and and I, you'd leave it to me to feel like, you know, I was worried about appearance. <laughs> so I get my keys, which are sitting on the table in, in a bowl in front of me. And it's been a long time since I talked about this. It's it kind of shaking me up a little bit. Um, and I, I picked up the keys and um, my hand was shaking where I was holding the keys. And my daughter looked at me, and she, as an adult, she said, you know, Dad, I knew at that moment something was seriously wrong because your hand was shaking. And I looked at him and I said, let's go to Grandma's house. Now, 9 o'clock at night, we're going to Grandma's. And I said, well, get a soda. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to keep as casual as I could. So we get up and we, you know, the boys fought with me a little bit. I'm like, come on, it'll be fun, you know. So we get to the door and it was an old house and you open the door and you had to put the key in on the outside to lock it. You couldn't lock it from the inside and just close the door. Right. It was one of those old fashioned locks. And so I remember closing the door there behind me, standing on the porch and I put the key in the lock and I turned the key in the house from inside. Um, a man's voice started screaming. Now, I wasn't the only one that heard this. The dogs in the neighborhood started barking at the same moment. Um, the kids heard it, and we were on we were we were on our way at that point. Um, and we got in the car, and I remember us driving away. Now my son had been telling me that there was something that had been standing in the upstairs window um, all the time, and he would say that he kept seeing this and he, as we're driving away he's like dad there it is and i looked up in the upstairs window which was right above the porch area and there stood the black figure of the man wow. and we drove away and we went to my parents house and i thought at that point well i don't know what i'm gonna do you know it, it, justification Stephen kicked in you know that 
that same thing that I grew up with, the same thing I did all my life, where it's where I started justifying it. And over the period of a whole week that I was gone, I justified it. And we ended up going back eventually when I got home. And we're not with very good results. And when we got back to the house, um, you know, the kids, I told them they would be fine, which is hard now, uh, because we weren't. And there's a lot more to this. I'm kind of capsulizing it for you for the show, because we could talk for hours on this. Um, but I, my, the kids were in the bedroom on the lower level they were playing. There was two doors to that bedroom. There was one that went into the kitchen and one that came out into the living room. My mother called while they were in the room. I could hear them playing. And I'm talking to her on the phone. And at some point during that phone conversation, um, I hear the doors shake. And, I, and I'm not talking one door. I'm talking doors shake. Right. Like somebody had grabbed them and shook them, you know? I don't know how else to explain it. And I told the kids to cut it out because I thought they were out playing, running around, you know? My mom says, what's going on? Ain't nothing, the kid. And it happened again. You know, and it was kind of like the proverbial scary movie because every time I would say this, it would happen again. It would be stronger and louder, you know? And it, it, it did this like two or three times. And then I heard my daughter say from the bedroom, she said, Dad, I'm in here. My brothers are asleep. Um, what's going on? And that's when both the doors to that bedroom slammed shut. And at this point, the only way I can describe this to you is that the house was shaking. Um, I kind of understand it now because I understand that at the point, and I did at that point, but now I do, but at the dispensing of all this energy will cause this. You know, um, I've heard of even crazier things happening, like it raining inside a house, which didn't happen there. But this was a shaking. And the guy was screaming. I could hear the guy screaming. Now, if you talked to my daughter, she would have told you that she heard more than one voice screaming. I heard the guy screaming. And I ran to the door that was closest to me, which was in the living room, and I went to open the door because I could hear her screaming now behind the door. And I threw my body against the party. There was what when you opened the door? I, I couldn't get the door open. It wouldn't open. Oh. And I could hear her screaming too now with this thing screaming as well. And I started throwing my body against the door. Now, I'm six foot seven. I'm a big guy. Yeah. And I wasn't going through that door. And as a matter of fact, when it was all over, my whole one side where I was trying to get in the door was bruised, actually. It was like throwing myself up against a brick wall. By all means, it was a wood door. I should have brought it down. And she's screaming. Okay. And I can remember thinking, God, open this door, you know. And at that point, the door flew open. I went flying into the room. The boys were obviously stirring, waking up. You know, and I told them to get out of the room, go go outside. And they ran out the front door and I got to my daughter. She was in shock. I grabbed her and I carried her out of the house with me. And as I was leaving, I could feel something on my feet as I was exiting. And I didn't turn around to see what it was. Um, we went into the, the top of the street where I could look into the house. I could see in the house it was summer. You know, we had all the windows and uh, we had the drapes open and I could see something moving around inside the house and my parents came at that point. And that's the last time my kids went into the house and it's really the last time that we lived in the house. Um, I would have to go back for things like clothing and stuff like that um, in the process of what we had to do to get out of it. But that's basically um, the beginning of it all. Wow. How, did you ever find out what it was? Well, you, I can tell you what people think. You know, um, there's times when I, I think, well, it must have been this. And there's times when I don't know. But there was a Civil War soldier that had owned the land. And as a matter of fact, where the, the Screaming House sat was... If you look at the plot of where his house was and what was there, it was between the stable and the slave quarters. Um, 
And he wasn't a very good man. He was, a, he was actually a very neat man. Um, as a matter of fact, later on, I talked to an ancestor of his and that talked about just how awful he was. And um, so I don't know. You know, there's the, there is tellings of um, his wife became pregnant. I, I, there's a whole story to this that I've heard. You know, his wife became pregnant. He it was why he had been gone. Um, he was one of the slaves, and none of the, the male slaves would admit to it. So he lined them up and he shot them all, killed them, and he um, also killed the baby as well. Um, and not only did he kill the baby, he hung it out of a tree to let everyone know that not to cross him again. Now, that's what I've heard. Um, do I believe it is the reason? Well, it would be a, a pretty darn good reason, and I've gotten enough um, history and background on it to believe that maybe it's probably true. I mean, if there was ever a thing that could cause something like this, I would think it would, that would do it, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. So, and yeah, I, you know, I got into this because I wanted those answers. I wanted answers as to why and what. I don't think I've ever fully gotten all of the answers. I mean, you talk to different people. You talk, you know, the, the church, I, I know you know this, wrote a whole report on the house in the haunting itself. And I did from the church. Oh, yeah, the Roman Catholic Church. It was um, 156 pages, which if anyone wants to, to read it, you can read it online. Um, at my website, you know, okay. uh, you know the chance.com and see, you'll find the downloadable PDF there. You can read it yourself and see what the church had to say about it. So, you know, I have the church telling me it was demonic. Uh, it was this, it was that, you know, um, you have other people. I mean, I wish I had a penny for every um, person I ever brought in there that, that, that would tell me it was, it was this, this ghost or that ghost, you know. If there's just so much there. Uh, I had, you know, there, there was later, I went back to help a family that was living there. Um, and I, I brought in a psychic from uh, actually the Lund Mansion in St. Louis, uh, which is a very haunted location. Um, and she said that she got the presence of a man. I mean, there was just, everybody has their own ideas of what it could be. I can't tell you 100% sure what I think it is, I know it is, and it didn't like me. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. Um, but, you know, I know that there were other families that were affected by this thing beforehand, like years and years. I know, and they've talked to people in the neighborhood who live there and who live there now that have experienced it, that see the things in the windows, that hear the screams. As a matter of fact, it was interesting that the man that lived across the street when I lived there, he said that he 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 saw all of this go on. He would see it. He saw us leaving in the middle of the night. He he heard the screams. He heard saw the things in the windows and stuff. And I said, "Well, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you come and tell me that this had happened before that I was in a situation?" He goes, "Because I knew you weren't going to stay there." And that's kind of the attitude of the people that lived in that neighborhood had where I knew you weren't going to stay there for a while. They just, they just didn't interact with you. So, yeah, um, there's, there's a lot of things it could be. To tell you for 100% certainty, I would be lying to tell you that I believed 100% of anything. Do I believe it was demonic? Well, I, I think that's a matter of labels. <laughs> you know, I think I, I don't get, I'm not one to get in labels. You know that about me, I'm sure. Right. Um, I don't like labeling things because I think, you know, um, what we're dealing with when we're dealing with stuff like this is things that is be very difficult to label because I don't think we really have a full knowledge of what we should be labeling these or how we should be labeling them. And I don't want to do it wrongly because what I don't want to do is I don't want to Oh, justify things to myself again, and, and falsely so. And I don't want to give out people this idea of something that I'm not sure it is. So 
I can only do is I can present to you what it was, what happened, what other people think, uh, what I think. And there you go. That's 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 how I that's how I got started in all of this. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, that's probably not the right word. Um, um, it's really a great shakeup into the field <laughs> and for your children. How did they yeah. survive afterwards with all this? Or well. well it, it was it was hard because you know when their their mother left it it left uh it left a pretty big scar i mean um they fell completely apart so i had just it seemed like i had just got them put back together you know uh when this happened and so it was a matter of you know when you when you deal with children that have gone through uh, divorce and gone through literally being deserted by a parent. Um, you deal with uh, a security issue. It's about, you know, they need stability, they need security. So when you live in this kind of situation, stability and security go out the damn door with it, you know? So it took a while to rebuild them back after that. Um, I, I gotta tell you, they're fine today. They're, they're good, they're functioning adults and they're living good lives. But. Um, it was, yeah, it was a little touch and go. We went to a psychologist afterwards uh, because I just thought, I, you know, I got to do something. I mean, I got to help them in some way because I just knew it was going to was gonna scar them for life. Um, and the psychologist, he, he talked to us one by one, and after it was all over with, he, he sat me down and he goes, you're all suffering from post-traumatic stress. Then I said, well, obviously. Um, but he said, you're all high functioning, dealing with your post-traumatic stress. And, uh, and he goes, I, I, you're going to be okay. I think you're just too worried about it. You know, he, he really, he really kind of put my mind at ease at that point because, you know, he told us we were going to be all right. And um, I had a professional tell us it was going to be okay. And also a professional at that point tell us, okay, this is what you're dealing with. You know, you're dealing with some post-traumatic stress with this. Yeah. That, yeah, that's reassuring. Um, I don't think I've ever told anybody that, by the way, until you just now. On, you know, that what? On, 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 yeah, on the show. I don't think I've ever told anybody that before, on the show before. So, oh, wow. that's, I keep kicking you. I'm sorry. Oh, no. Well, thank you. That's, that means a lot. Um, yeah, it does. I get to be at a little bit of a loss for words now. It's such an incredible journey. Um, and yeah, I know you go into some of it in the books, um, which I haven't read yet. I need to. Um, well, they're the best telling because I, I wrote it, you know, um, that was my, my dump of it all. You know, I, I got to tell you that first book, The Uninvited, was very much, I just opened my head and, and got it out. I had to talk about it. I had to, I had to tell it. And I had to tell it. I, you know, we had did that, that, that show, A Haunting. And, you know, they, they tried to tell this big, huge story in 45 minutes. You know, it's television. It's how it works. And they did an okay job. But there was so much of it that, that wasn't told that I felt like, you know, if I was going to tell this, I needed to, I needed to sit down and tell it. And I had friends that were telling me, you know, you really need to do this. And, and, I, and I was resistant. And I, the reason I think I was resisting is I knew what well, was like telling you it today. It's like it's, it's this thing that comes back and it's, you try to put it away, you know. Right. And writing it was was very much that and but in a way it was very therapeutic i think it got a lot of it out um so yeah the, the books are interesting in a way because they, they, you know they, they come from they came from a, a place of 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 complete and utter i gotta get this out i don't know how else to say it yeah now can you put there's a I think it says private, either 
if you can get into the comments or the private chat, can you type in your website? If it's in the well, I, I can't see right now. Um, oh, okay, then. But it's easy, guys. I can tell you what it is. It's stevenlachance.com. Oh well, I can do that. I can. <laughs> That's how easy it is. I try not to make it too difficult for anybody. Here we go. There, there we go. Did you get it? Okay, I think I've got it. Okay. Some days my contacts work better than others do. Right. Okay, great. Oh. Well, and then from that, you've gone ahead and turned this into pretty much a career. I mean, you've got several books out. You've got several shows and everything else that you've been part of it's any strange, way. isn't it? I, it was weird. Um, I, I, I went on this journey and I started looking, like I told you, for answers for myself. And as I as I was doing this, people started being, you know, first with the other body, they were interested in that. And then they found out that I was actually researching on my own and they started showing interest. And I'm like, well, guess it's a place to put all of this stuff. So I started sharing it in that way. Um, and it, you, it just kind of took a life of its own, you know, and, and it took me in a lot of different directions I never thought I would go to, but it's been quite, quite the journey, actually. Fantastic. Yeah, Katie, um, who's a friend of mine, said, The Inv Uninvited is an amazing book. I need to read it again. I'm glad it was therapy for you to write it, Stephen. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I, I hope you got something out of it. I, I, you know, with with the book, I I think everybody can relate to it in a lot of ways um, because we all go through stuff in our lives. You know, whether it's a, the haunting is there, but there's all kinds of other stuff that that led into the haunting that fed it actually. Um, you know these things usually happen to people at the, the lowest points of their lives, right? And I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, and it's, and I, well, if you look at it, I, I look at um, some of the other like things out there, and it does seem like that is a common denominator. In it. And okay. I don't know whether it is, well, it's an energy thing, negative, you know, negative draws negative. Um, Right. Positive draws positive. And I think, you know, in my case, in, it was how I got myself through it is I had to change my mindset. Because uh, my mom would tell you I had to take the kick me sign off my back. <laughs> she, she was wise through it all. And, and, and her, her view was, you know, if you wear that kick me sign on your back, the world's going to come up and the universe is going to come up and it's going to kick you. You need to take that right. sign. She was right. Yeah, your mom was wise. Yeah. She, she way, be, way beyond anything that I could imagine. I was very lucky to have her through it all. Yeah. When Katie's saying it was so impressive that you helped the next family who rented the house. The next family that rented the house? What did she want to know about? No, she said it was so impressive that you helped them. Yes. Well, it was, it was actually... The family that lived right after I did um, had things going on. As a matter of fact, my father stopped there to get the mail one day because you know how the mail takes forever to switch over. And um, the woman came to the door that was living there. My dad said, <laughs> he said he felt funny asking the question. He said, but I asked, you know, you got anything going on here? And she said, why do you ask that? And he said, well, my son, when he lived here, there was a lot going on, and, and she said, yeah, 
that you know she had a lot going on, and she explained some of the things that were very much like what we were going through happening to her there. And then there was another family in between there, and then the family that I actually went in to help. Um, okay. It's not like the TV show. If you watch the TV show, you see me knock on the door, and you see this woman answer the door, and I'm sort of like the the paranormal welcome wagon. It didn't work that way. I wasn't standing at the door saying, your house is haunted. Can I help you? She came and found me. She came and found me, and I was, you know, surprised when she did, and I thought, you know, I still had things going on, because there was things that followed us from there. And so I went back for the reason that I went back to help myself as much as I went to help her, you know. All of a sudden, I had this partner in crime, and we were going to figure this out together. And that was more the telling of it than um, what the TV show showed, um, which was uh, very different than what it was in real life. Yeah. Okay. Television. She, she, she did watch it. Yeah. Yeah, um, that was a haunting. Um, but yeah, that, uh, it, they, they, they made me look like I, I just, I don't know, I was. I wasn't that anxious to get back there. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Well, I was wondering how. Um, I was wondering. Excuse me. I totally had an ADHD moment, and my. Oh, I have. Them. You're, you're right. <laughs> my thought just totally went out of my head um and hopefully it'll come back probably right in the next in the middle of another topic so well how what kinds of things are you working with now working with now i, I travel a lot um I, 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 there's gonna be some of that coming eventually right now i'm getting ready to release I, I, I decided to do something that after I wrote the book, I wrote a book called uh, Confrontation with Evil about six years ago on the St. Louis case that um, inspired the movie The Exorcist. And that book took a lot out of me. And I, I'm not so sure. <laughs> I'm not so sure I'm ever going to do that kind of thing again. Um, so I, but I, I wanted to write things to people for people because, you know, I, I have a lot of people that were like, well, what are you going to do next? What are you, what's up? And I want to do my, re I wanted to put my research into, into books, but I don't necessarily want to put myself into that. Does that make sense? Um, yes. Because you, you have to, I learned through the years that you have to have that wall of separation from you and it. Um, the Exorcist book taught me that, trust me, in ways that you cannot even imagine. It almost, it almost kept me from writing ever again. But uh, I decided that I wanted to use my research, but I wanted to tell stories um, using that research that were not um, connected, that were more inspired by sort of things. Um, okay. That I wasn't telling somebody else's story, but I was telling the um, circumstances and the facts around certain things that happen and how they happen. Um, still educate, but entertain as well. And so that's sort of what I'm working with now. Um, you'll see the first inclination or the, the, first, um, the first result of that come out in October when Glow um, hits the bookshelves, which is my next now, book. Where will it be available? Tell you, worldwide, um, anywhere where books are sold and downloaded, able to get low um and if it's not on your bookshelf there you can order it from there okay um but yeah it's it's going to be a major release and it's um it's an interesting it's an interesting book uh very all of the, the there's three books i'm doing they're, they're money i call it modern horror but they're all three there's something about them that's personal there's something about them that comes from my research um, and all of that combined into a story. Um, okay.
to to share it all. And um, glow is is more of about um, nightmares and how nightmares affect these things and how sleep paralysis is a part of them and um, what those things are, how they work and how contagious um, these things we might believe evil are. And um, because I really do believe they're parasitical in some ways. Um, so glow kind of um, is all of that together. And there was a certain amount of cases that were coming out and coming to me all around 2009, around that area, um, where I was hearing about these stories and they were all young, basically young men, um, where this nightmare kind of thing was happening with them. Um, in a couple of the cases, it resulted in suicide. So this book is going to get into a, a lot of that sort of thing. Um, okay. And it's interesting. It sounds like an important it's, book, actually. Um, it, well, it's important in that way, but I, I also wanted, you know, I wanted be the, I, there was two, two audiences for it. I wanted so the paranormal people like us could pick it up and read it and get something out of it. You, you can learn from my research because here's a telling of it in a different way, but it's there. And then I wanted it for the people that are not like us um, to pick it up and maybe, you know, they can be one entertained by it. But number two, I want them to be able to, um, and all of us, the readers, to be able to get something out of it where it starts them thinking on their own. Because I think a lot of this lies as far as the answers. We're never going to have outwardly really answers. A lot of the answers lies within ourselves and what we believe. What we think, and if I can make another person think about things that maybe they would never have thought about, I think I'm doing my job, don't you? Right. Right. That makes sense. And I think the more we know and understand, the less frightening things are. Exactly. It's ex exactly it. You got it. You got it. Yeah. You know, it's it's the funny thing about some of this is is somebody saying, "Well, what was the scariest thing that ever happened to you?" And it's like, well, you know, the scariest thing that ever happened to me could be very different to what you frame scary to be or frightening to be. And I think you know when I wrote the Undivided, it was that thing about it in my personal experience that frustrated me because it's the, 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 the I want to be scared part of it, you know, it's very human, but at the same point, um, fear um, comes from very varied and different places. It doesn't come from just the, the jump scare or that. It's, it's emotional. There's emotions involved in these things. Um, there's sadness. There's regret, there's happiness sometimes, um, there's longing, there's all kinds of emotions that, that make this thing that we call an event or we call a haunting or we call this or that. I mean, all of these things play into this. And I think so many times, especially when we look at television, and I can talk to you as someone that has done a lot of it, I think as we look at television, a lot of the things, especially a lot of... Um, the paranormal shows, um, they want to focus on the fear of it or the oh, yeah, fright. That of it. sells. Yeah, well, it does. You know, if you know, if if it screams, it bleeds. It leads. <laughs> you know, it's true. And I I think that's where we're making a huge mistake because I think more of this stuff should be about all of the other things. It was very frustrating when I wrote. The Blessed or the Wicked is a follow up to the Uninvited. And the only reason I ever wrote that book was because people wanted me to write it to answer questions about things that, that remained. So I did. And the important thing about it was is I wanted to explain to people that everything about your life plays into this. You know, there's not one thing. You, and I think this was the message that most people had the hardest with, you play a very integral part in your haunting in your life, um, whatever a haunting is, your circumstance, you have to admit where you play into that to understand how to deal with it and how to get yourself out of it, how to lift yourself up. And 
I think that's a, a message that we're missing a whole, whole lot uh, with a lot of this. And I hope the books are doing that. I hope a lot of the things that I'm doing are helping with that. Right. Right. And, you know, well, I was thinking, too, just with your experience, you may have responded very differently if you weren't responsible for three children who had just gone through enough trauma. Already. Oh, definitely. Definitely, because that's your focus at the point. You know, it's like, you, that, you know, we talked about people saying, well, were you skeptical before this? And it's like, you know, you have to understand as a single parent, your whole life is tunnel vision, at least if you're doing it right. Yeah. It's tunnel vision on those individuals that you are in care of by yourself, you know? And you still have to pay the bills. You still have to pay the bills. It's a tremendous responsibility. And then when you, once you pay pay that kind of money to move into a place and stuff. It's not, you know, it takes a lot to get you to pack up and go, you know. Right. I, I always I always think about that. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, the, I, I was lucky. I was able to do that. I was able to, to pack up and go. But there's a lot of people that, that aren't. You know, there's a lot of people that, you know, the woman that I went to help, she, she wasn't able to just pick up and leave like I was able. Um, and I think that's another part of it as well, you know, yeah. it's bothersome. Yeah, and I'm wondering with her too, in my experience, a lot of entities modify a little bit, and I use the word entity because I don't like to put a name or a label or anything. Good, that's a good thing. And, you know, it's... There's so many different things we're dealing with. Um, but we call things in a way, because like you said, like attracts like in a sense. Right. It's not like a magnet. And this way, energy, if you're living in a situation that's full of chaos and turmoil or anger, then it's likely going to affect and feed any entity that's around exactly. there or call that kind in and then they like to create more of it because they have a bigger buffet to dine on in a sense mm -hmm. and if you uh, put out um, an opposite energy then the so much of what your attracts to the place either changes to match that or um, only that kind come in. And um, I've worked a lot with people as a medium who have had houses where they wanted it, it scared them, they wanted it to go away. And nothing traumatic as far as, you know, there aren't knives being thrown at people or anything like that, just anything from footsteps to voices to things when you don't know what they are, they're scary, but right, right. they weren't life threatening. And then working with them, contacting the entities um, and getting a feel for what's there, who's there, helping the homeowner or resident with some ground rules and they're fine. They're happy to let the entity stay. Because you know, they, it's no longer an unknown. It's no longer a monster on the closet wall. It's the moon shining through the tree branches, waving right. in the wind through the shade on the window. But you know, there's another aspect of this too that a lot of people don't think about, and that is the addiction to the haunting itself. People are that live through this actually become addicted to it. And what, here's what I mean by this. Um, there's a thing known as, you know, the dopamine adrenaline, that is fear causes. It's addicting. It's addicting. So I remember, you know, come, when we were coming out of it near the end of it all. And I can remember us, I was talking to um, my friend who I was helping. And she looked at me and she said, what are we going to do when it's all gone? 
right. to, you know, what are we going to do when there is no more haunting, you know, when there is no more fear, when there is no more screaming, when, you know, and it's like, and I thought about that and I'm like, you're right. And when you do finally are able to get away from it, you have to rebuild how you live because it is an addiction. And that is also, you know, it's almost like, you know, taking responsibility for your addiction, taking responsibility for your honey. It's almost the 12 step program coming out of it. I mean, really, <laughs> you know, it, it, it is in a lot of ways. And, and to, to re, to re think about how you think of things. I'll, I'll give you an example that was really helpful to me. And it was my youngest son at one point during, you know, uh, helping the other family and stuff and all everything that was going on there, which was, was quite something. But he looked at me and he said, dad, he goes, you went, you know, he used the labels that I don't use. He went, you went chasing demons and you found them and they were there. Why don't you go looking for angels and out of the mouths of babes. Right. Right. And I thought, wow, you know, that's true. You know, if you go, looking for this or you crave this or you're addicted to this it's going to give it to you you know be careful what you ask for because you will get it you know and it's just this whole mindset thing and so i started taking this mindset idea of when i woke up every day um i would start thinking about was there one thing i was grateful for in the day to start the day you know, in some days, I got to be honest with you, some days were just the simple thing that I was given another day to wake up. Other than that, you know, but as you went on, I started adding things. You know, grateful I woke up today. I'm grateful for my kids. I'm grateful to, you know, I'm able to provide. I'm being grateful for. And you, this thing starts growing. And as it starts growing, you have this thing on this side. And this scary thing over here, it starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Because as this grows, this can't grow no more. You see what I'm saying? Absolutely. And it, it, it very much was how it was in a, in a lot of ways. Yeah. yeah it's, I think that's really important to know. And we forget. And we also become not just addicted to things like this, but it can be so much part of our identity like people who have the victim identity or or um, um, a kind of a, a profile where they seem to be attracted to situations that um, put them in that position um, not trying to blame people for um, what happens to them I'm not doing that at all but it becomes so much of who they are and what they know that they automatically just go into um, in a situation that can be abusive. And I mean, it could be work situations. It doesn't even have to be personal or anything else, mm -hmm. just bad bosses. Or I think it's, it's, it's good living skills, you know? Yes. It's, it's, it's good things to live by. It's, it's, it's how it all, I'll give you an example. I had a, a case come to me once and it was this woman, and every picture she would take, she would get the craziest stuff in her pictures. And I, and I saw her do this and she kept showing me these pictures and I said, well, this frightens you. Yes, it frightens me that I get these things in my pictures. And they said, well, quit taking the pictures. Yeah. And she couldn't because she was addicted to the fact that she was getting this stuff. You know, you couldn't have pried that camera out of her hands because the more it happened, the more she wanted it to happen, whether she wanted to admit it or not. And it, it, I found that interesting. And I, I was talking to my, my good friend, um, John Zaffis, the, the, the haunted collector. Yeah. And they said, Johnny, this happens. And he, he told me something that was interesting. And it always kind of stuck with me. And, and he told me, he goes, Stephen, he goes, my, my uncle, who was Ed Ward, he said, he told me at one point, you can take the horse to water, but you can't force him to drink. 
Right. You know, mm-hmm. simple, right? Simple idea. But that simple idea, I have to tell you, if I hadn't figured out on my own and I didn't have my mother there to help me and my children, is, um, I, I, I don't know if I'd still be sitting here today. You know, I mean, you got to help yourself. No one's going to help you. You know, you can go look at the, for the church and you can go look for an investigative group. You can go do all of these things. All of these things might give you advice and they might help lead you. But the truth of the matter is the real work of all of this is going to come from you. Right. And understand that. That nobody, mm-mm. and, oh, it's that way with therapy. It's that way with physical health. Um, you name it. Um, they can give you keys on how to work with it and do it but you've got to pick up and take responsibility and do the work ourselves and some of that is not comfortable because we have to admit that oh maybe we misinterpreted or maybe we were wrong or maybe our motive was this not this or Maybe when I was three, I didn't understand it the way it was meant, you know, or something like right. that. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And it's, you know, in, it, so it becomes this thing once you get past all of that other stuff, you know, that now I live a very different life, a very um, more enlightened life, maybe. Because I, I understand these things are around me, and, and they're around me all the time. And I'm not frightened by the opening of a door, or I'm not frightened by the turning on of a light. Um, Good. You know, which, you know, in the early years, things like that would set you down this path. And of course, every time you would react to that, it would get worse. It would happen again and again and get worse and worse and worse. You know, I I understand these things around me. And now when I travel, it's opened up a whole new world to me as far as learning about the world and learning that when I get out of um, what was my comfort zone um, in little mid-Missouri, Um, and out into the world, that the world is this vast place and there's so many understandings and um, there's so many cultures that understand it a whole lot better um, than the infancy infancy of what we understand it to be, honestly, in the United States, you know. Not um, just the Western world or Western culture, but in this country in particular. In particular, yes. Mm -hmm. And I found that shocking, and I, I, I've learned a whole lot, and it's, um, it's interesting to me now. Um, history means a whole lot more. Going someplace um, that's of, uh, that has a, an ancient history to it, or a history to it, has become a whole different thing, uh, a whole different experience. And I'll give you, I can, I can give you a story if we have, do we have time for a story? Yeah. Uh, um, I, I was in uh, Leopoldstadt in Vienna, which is the Jewish quarter in Vienna. Okay. Um, I, I, we, we, we rented an apartment there for a couple weeks. Uh, it, it was kind of energetically, it could be a very uh, oppressive place in some ways um, because the history is there. I mean, everywhere you went, um, you would see these brass plaques and on the brass plaques, you probably see them, um, would tell you um, who lived there, what happened to them at the time of the Holocaust. Um, you would go by a mosque, uh, not a mosque, but a... Uh, synagogue. Yeah, synagogue, excuse me. There, see, I just did what you did. A yeah, synagogue, good. and you Thanks would see the armed guard. You would yeah. hear the, them worshiping and singing inside, and you'd see the armed guard standing out, and you realize that history is still very much a real thing here. Well, we stayed in a, in our building looked, I thought it looked very, felt very 1960s. And I think it was renovated to give it that feel. And so I, there were strange things going on there. And, um, and I was like, well, this is, 
this is not, you know, I would wake up in the middle of the night and there was a, a male standing in the room, kind of thing. Um, I, I even turned to go, I had a ghost box on once and it, it was a male talking and that kind of stuff, you know, and, and but the dreams were really, really very strong. And I, I, I was telling Rick, you know, that I don't understand it. Well, if you get into the history of Leopold Stott, a lot happened there and a lot happened to a lot of people. But I didn't think it happened in our building. So it was the very last morning, the very last day. Now, I had all of this stuff going on for the whole two, couple of weeks we were there. And I step in front of the building and I'm waiting for the car to come pick us up to take us to the airport. And I looked down in front of the building and I hadn't seen this up until that point. I looked down and there was a brass plate. You know, and in my dreams, this thing kept telling, this man kept telling me that they had come and they had taken all of them away, as in a lot of people, and they took all of our shoes from us. And I looked down at my feet, and there at my feet was the brass, a brass plaque. And 36 people had lived in that building, and all of them had perished in Auschwitz. <laughs> Now I see this brass plaque as the car is pulling up, and I look up, and standing directly across from me, across the street, is uh, this this ancient rabbi, and he was very, very old. And he looks at me, and he's got tears in his eyes, and I had tears in my eyes, and I can't explain the feeling. There was this knowing that went back and forth between the two of us, and then as I got in the car, he watched us drive away. Very esoteric. I can't explain it to you. It's, it's something I really can't put into words. But that's the kind of thing that this has opened up for me as far as historical travel goes and historical experience goes. Because those kind of things just happen everywhere I go now. And I think it's just because I'm open to and I understand. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I do. I think, well, shoot, I teach people how to open to mm -hmm. that world around and to see the history. Um, and I'm pretty good at detaching from some of a lot of it because you know, it's my I give a so lot much of a focus in a right. I wasn't ever a professional historian. I won't call myself a historian. Right. But I have a bachelor's in it. I've studied, I've done, and from an academic enjoyment level, not an impersonal involvement level, you know? And so, so a lot of times, but when you're standing at something like that or one of the camps or something, I can't <laughs> describe it. I, you know, there's just no feeling. There's no, there's no words in my vocabulary anyway to express it um but i have people ask me at times um uh how do you do you think you're gifted because these you know these things are around you or do you think you're gifted because these things happen to you or, or cursed because these things happen to you i guess and you can go go either way with that couldn't you i guess but i always i always tell them it's like it's something that we all innately have. I think some of us have it a little bit more so than others, maybe. But it's like, um, for me, it was like hot and cold water. You know, I didn't understand the difference between hot and cold. Now, there's people will tell you that hot and cold can feel the very, very much the same if you didn't know the difference. Uh -huh. But once you know the difference, you know what hot feels like and what cold feels like. And that's kind of, I just know how this feels like now. I understand it now. I don't dismiss it now. Um, right. I don't justify it now the way I used it. Still very skeptical. I, I think I'm, I'm probably I'm probably become more skeptical over the years of this research than I ever was before because there's a lot of crazy crap out there, and there's a lot of crazy people out there, and um, there's a lot of people that would like to peddle you um, and sell you tickets to a bridge or sell you the bridge. And so I think that's made me a little bit more skeptical than I ever was before. 
Uh, yeah. And I hate being like that. I, I'd like to be more open. So in honestly, that's why I work more with myself and by myself anymore now. Because I trust me, you know, mm -hmm. I trust my experience. I trust the experience of my, my husband. And I I've got that. a couple people that I will work with because I entrust their integrity. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, I don't always necessarily agree, but I know they're not making it up. Right. And that they could be seeing something I'm not. Right. I'm not the end all and be all of all things metaphysical and psychic and No, I well, none of us are, are we? I no. mean really, I mean this is a learning thing. Right. Nobody's got the right or wrong answer, William. <laughs> exactly. You know? And so I, I, I do have a little bit of limited, but mostly I work alone too. Um, and my focus is a little different. I, I know they're in the house or in the bi building. I know they exist. I've had too many. I'm one of the people I believe because I've had not just psychic experiences. I've had physical experiences that I cannot describe or come up with any other answers for, you know, and that includes other kinds of beings and stuff, but it's hard for me to believe in something I haven't physically seen. And um, um, I haven't run across anything pure evil and I haven't run across anything pure good. I've, you know, my question to people always is when they come to me is I'm like, you know, they describe whatever's happening to them. And then the question that always happens is with, with those that are looking for help is, uh, what do you think this is? And my question to them is like, first, I'm like, I'm not living through this. You're living through this. You're the expert of what's going on. What do you think this is? Right. That's the real question. I'm more interested in what you are experiencing and what you might think that experience is. Because truth of the matter is, is you're going to have a better handle on it than I am without experiencing it. I can tell you things that I've seen or things that I've learned along the way. But the truth of the matter is, is your situation, what you are going through, you are the expert of that situation. Right. You think and it then is? From, from there, I think it's important to look at okay well what kinds of filters and boxes is okay. that understanding going through of that experience exactly and it tell you a lot about a person too they really yes. Will. yes because oh in some places this is evil and in some place anything well shoot with some traditions we're we're demons anyway um just because of who we are, you know, um, and it's it's important, I think, to understand the built-in bias <clears throat> we all have about any type of activity or paranormal, um, and try to look at it objectively without any of those labels or boxes that's and hard let the being let the thing tell us what it is you know i can't tell you um how many times through the years i thought i i, I learned something and within six months my mind would completely change and i think that happens to a lot of people you know, um, I think we're all like that. It's the ones that get stuck in that rut. That's why I always tell you know, the paranormal investigators, I'm like, do not, do not follow the herd. Because the herd's going to tell you that these certain things are the things that you must do. And let me tell you, that is not going to teach you anything. You are not going to learn anything by following the path. You get out there and you figure it out on your own. You figure out what works for you, what you to believe to be true, what you think these things are or what you're learning. And, you're, and give yourself the permission to change your mind, you yes. know? 
it, it's so it's so easy when we sit and talk about it, but so hard to do for some people. Right, because it's you get into a conversation with somebody, and um, they they may say something totally different than what you're thinking about, but it can spark that chain reaction of, oh, I'd never thought about it that way before. Maybe there's something else here I'm not seeing, or maybe this isn't what I was thinking it is. Um, and I think that's an important part of life, just in general. Right. Um, not that we get wishy-washy on true values, but, um, well, as somebody who loves history, look at all the changes of understanding we've had in our lifetimes mm -hmm. about the uh, development of culture and civilization and what we were doing how far back. Um, we Human species is really pretty amazing and it you know it should be after homo sapiens have been around two or three hundred thousand years um you know you you know and humans have been around for a few million so right you think we'd learn you know you would think but we don't and the the thing is too is why do we want to spend so much the time on death and dying when we only have this finite time here to live, you know, I think that's yeah. the difference. I, I'm not so focused on the death part of it anymore. Uh -huh. I died once, you know, I, I died on the operating table. So death is not something that frightens me. Um, but I, I know that there's something else in that time will come, you know, this other thing is very much a part of living and being alive, and it's part of our living world. Um, and I think it's a way of looking at it that, that needs to be not so, you know, we don't all have to dress and have head to toe with um, in black and looking for, you know, looking like it's Halloween 365 days a year, unless that's what you want to do. But the thing is, is, you know, it doesn't have to be so dark and gloomy because these things that we're talking about are very living experiences a part of the living journey. And I, when I got that idea in my mind, and when that finally got through my thick skull, um, I really started to grow in a lot of different ways too. Um, and have a, you know, I think that's was one of the more important understandings I came to that it was more about the journey of living than it was the journey of death. Does that make yeah. sense? It does, it does. And okay, yes, we can go and see the lady in black that threw herself out the window when she saw her fiance with somebody else. Mm -hmm. But we can also <laughs> see the big parties and celebrations in that happened in that same location in the birthdays and the weddings that did happen and the anniversaries right. and um it's all part of life and i think um people earlier accepted that and maybe we're a little different because okay we had we had Various people living here for probably around 14, 15,000 years. Mm -hmm. um, and before the Europeans came over. But for the European based culture that came in, it was a pretty rough existence for a long time. And a lot of people didn't make it. And then traveling west, I have relatives that, you know, I'm, I'm a descendant of people who crossed on the Oregon Trail. Um, and maybe it's just because death was so available and we were working against it. But, you know, as I say that, then I think 
Well, look at medieval Europe. Talk about a good place to die. Um, because of disease and war and you name it. Um, but I think there is a difference in the attitude towards things. Um, I think there is a little bit more faith in, an, in a positive, perhaps, afterlife in medieval Europe. I think you see a lot of that still. You know, and I'll give you an example. I was, I was in Germany. I think it was Regensburg, Germany. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting at a, a, a cafe restaurant um, at the edge of the bridge, this old, old bridge. And it was 900 and something years old. They've been making sausages for 900 years at this oh, restaurant. Kind of I mean, you know, the people, the, the, the soldiers on the way to the Crusades, they stopped there to get sausage. You know, stop and think about this. With a name like Becker, sausage resonates. <laughs> And I, I, it hit me that where in the United States can you go that has been serving, that has been open as a restaurant for 900 years? No place. No place. And I think there's been, there, there lies the difference in some of it. Um, it's so accessible in a lot of these places that they, they just, they don't know. And I, they don't care. It's not that they, they don't know. I, I think they know, but they just don't care. It's no big deal to them. You know? Right. It's just and part they of it. protect the history and the heritage, but it's just part right. of life and part of the fabric of it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's, it's crazy. It's, it's, it's interesting, though. But, and, you know, the, the, the one thing, if you're able, that I would suggest to anybody is get out of your comfort zone. Step outside of your bubble. Um, force yourself to. And if you do this, I promise you, you're going to change a whole lot about your ideas about life and living. You really will. Yes. And it doesn't have to just be to, tra to go do it by traveling. Um, traveling gets expensive, I know. You can um, read. You can read. Yep. Um, my travel funds are a little bit empty these days well you know look at the we have these things called computers now that sit in front of yeah. us that can take you anywhere you want to go you can learn about absolutely anything you want to learn about on any given day yeah. you want to travel and go 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 to your computer you can travel through there right but you can also go down to the egyptian coffee house instead of the one you always go to Exactly. Or if you always go to the Egyptian, go to um, the one that's owned by somebody from India or <clears throat> or whatever. Or go to the art museum or talk to the neighbor or um, talk to your grandparents and great grandparents and oh my gosh, find yes. about life. And yeah, you want a source of information, there you go. I wish I could go back. Knowing what I know now, I wish I could go back and, and, and talk to them a little bit more. I was really fortunate. My dad's mother, um, she and my grandfather immigrated from the old country, mm. the babe in arms and one on the way, and in 1912. And she loved to talk about the old country and the family and everything else. And... Oh, she was 91 when she passed, and um, I think, well, I was, well, I was out of, I'd been out of college for a couple of years when she, when she passed out of university. So, um, you know, it's not like just a, a brief memory from when I was a little kid. My other grandmother well, she was born here, but um, immigrant ancestry. But so I get a little bit from her and from mom. But um, that was just a little bit more hushed. And Grandma Becker just was a fountain of knowledge and wisdom. And in fact, when we were in Russia, going to the Volga German areas, um, which is where we were from. Um, 
she had made a map with somebody and so actually one of the museums over there had a copy and I brought a bunch of copies and so we were able to go to where her house had been and where grandpa's house was and her grandparents' houses and all of that and because um, it was all marked on the map and um, it was great. Um, we learned so much from who we came from. Um, I had a I had a dream once um, of my grandmother, and in the dream, we were talking, and she she was sitting in the rocking chair outside, and the sky was bubbling up over, her, and it looked like it was going to storm. And at one point. Right before the dream ended, she looked at me and said, it's in the bloodline, honey. And then she it's broke into ravens. And it was frightening, what sure. She, but um, I go back and I, pardon me? I didn't quite hear what she, you said she said. She said, it's in the bloodline, honey. Uh, so it was in the bloodline. And, you know, in, actually, it's good advice. <laughs> yes. You know, it's good advice. I mean, we all have this lineage. And to understand your lineage is to understand yourself. Yes. Uh, to understand our history is to understand ourselves. Um, and, and, and that all plays into this too. I mean, it is, it is so much a part of everything that we are and every experience that we have around us that um, it's, it's, it's amazing to me that a lot of times people don't understand it or realize it or overlook that part of themselves. Um, or, you know, in, if you can't do your lineage, you know, you can do the history of where you are or where you came from, hopefully at least. Yeah. And, and actually, like, doing the history of a bit of where you grew up is is important too because that is the environment that you've got your lineage and your family that are part of and part of shaping you but you've also got the environment you were in as part of that well let me tell you i live in mexico in the yucatan uh -huh. on the caribbean sea not far from Cancun, but not far from, I have ruins maybe, oh, maybe 45 minutes away. We're actually probably closer than that. There's so many ruins around here, it's not even funny. Um, but the history here, and the fact that I am in a place where they're uncovering new history all the time. It's, yes. It's quite astonishing. And their beliefs in the belief system, especially within the mining community, the Mayans have really held on to a lot of the folklore in the belief systems. And it's interesting. It's interesting um, yeah. to learn about where you are in your space in the world. And I think that's, that's very, very important uh, to yeah. do. How people of the time explained the world around them mm -hmm. and what kind of gods they created to... We have a belief here... That. Right. We have a belief here. They believe in what is called an loose. Um, well, loose are little um, small creatures. Uh, think of a, it's the Mayan version of, and they'll get mad at me probably for saying this, but it reminds me kind of like the Mayan version of the leprechaun. And the Mayan loose, which? Uh, the leprechaun. <laughs> oh, okay. They're, they're these okay. little elfish things that are mischievous that live within the jungle. And um, as a matter of fact, if you have an Alush in your house, you have gremlins kind of things going on, mischief. And um, you build an Alush house, and you keep that house there for seven years, and then you have to close it up after seven years. Now, they believe this. So much so that they were building a highway, uh, an interpass over the highway. And they could, this bridge was going through all of these problems. They couldn't get this bridge built, couldn't get this bridge built. So they built a big loose house. It's, it looks like this pyramid at the bridge. And the bridge was able to be completed. This loose house has got a place of honor there, and it's still there. They believe in it that much. Um, but you start thinking about that, and you start going, well, 
you know, leprechaun. Uh, I can I think of the jinn. Uh, you think of elves. You know, all of these things that you've heard about and that people believe through um, different cultures and everything, they all play into this, this same sort of thing. Um, yes. And always, you know, there's always that belief, too, where there's smoke, there's fire. So these things have some basis of reality somewhere, you know, that they believe in it this strongly. And I think that's an, an, an interesting thing because not only was I learning about them, but I was understanding even into reaching into other cultures by their understanding of their culture, because that makes sense. And it, 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 it gets... Whoops, breaking up a little bit. Stephen, are you there? Are you there? We, we seem to have frozen. Hello? Okay, everybody, hopefully we'll get him back here. The connection still seems to be there. Just frozen up. Um, I think my, yeah, my internet connection is super strong. Steven? Well, maybe the leprechauns are um, getting it. Ah. Shoot. Hi. Because I do live near the jungle. I wasn't kidding you. So. Okay, now I'm going to remove the old one. All there. right. Okay. Yeah, we lost you um, pretty early. Oh, okay, now there's... For some reason, I can't get her to. Oh, here we go. This is Cindy Plume. She says, "Hi, Stephen. Sorry, I'm so late." Oh, hi, um, Cindy. He helped me many years ago, and he will call back hopefully. Oh, because of the. the well, she she understands living in the jungle. You hear the jungle sometimes. I notice it started raining. So when it starts to rain, you never know what's going to happen. Okay. It was funny, though, because we were talking about the loose when it happened, right? Exactly. And <laughs> I'm thinking, that sounds like um, a trickster. Mm -hmm. Every time, I'll tell you, we, we, we were in a hotel, it was before we moved here. And my husband, and I was telling him about the loose. Because at that, at that point, I was just started learning about it. And I said, well, there are these things. And I explained them all just like I did to you. And all of a sudden, the hotel room door we were in slammed open, and there was nobody there. <laughs> I so, love it. And those kind of things happen. So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But where there's and, smoke, there's fire. You know, most of them are wonderful. Um, and I do think I do think a lot of the beings that some of this lore is around do exist in it as interdimensional type of beings and i well that's something we get into when i get into a little bit of glow is the idea of um, the possibility of inter something interdimensional within that people are seeing within the nightmare world a um, good friend of mine rosemary ellen guiley did a lot of studies into the shadow people and that sort of thing and GLOW deals with a little bit of that and a little bit of the pathology behind these things. And a lot of people believe that um, they're very much interdimensional. And I think that's interesting you brought it up because it, I think a, a lot of that is the case. Rosemary used to tell me, you know, Stephen, all of these things are connected by one small thread that connects them all together. And if we can figure out what that thread is, We'll be able to figure out all of it, and I think she was right. And I, that's what we're looking for. We're looking the answer for that piece of thread. Okay, yeah, that sounds fascinating, and I think I think she's right. Um, or if it looks, it feels like that would be right. Um, 
Oh, there's so much we don't know. Oh, so much. <laughs> we, we could talk about this for a long time. Long yeah, time. and I love to learn. And um, it's it's not like it just ends when we stop here, too. I do a lot of between life work. And again, who knows? I know what I'm shown. And right. I know what they tell me. I have absolutely no way to prove any of it. Um, but what I see always when working with somebody who's passed is an existence of healing, of love, and pure joy and bliss. It doesn't matter how they passed. Um, no punishment. Learning. Um and being helped and a lot of people healing from the bruising the soul takes often in this existence because even with a good life the soul can have a yes, bit of a that's an interesting life. thought um when when i died on the operating table um, i was falling Felt like I was falling, um, mm -hmm. it, and I but I, I wasn't frightened, but it, I was falling, and I think it was probably the end of the experience because I had I, I probably wouldn't have wanted to come back if right. what I think happened before it happened. But um, I was falling, and I felt my soul slam back into my body. It's the best way I can describe it to you. But when it happened, it hurt. <laughs> Right. And I can remember thinking to myself at the moment that slam happened, that reality happened again, that I came back to this existence, this plane of understanding. The thought that went through my mind is, and it's, it's weird, but the thought that went through my mind was, I understand why we cry when we were born, because it hurts. This existence, oh. this existence hurts. And it was very clear to me in that moment that when we come into this world, we, we, we feel this, everything about it is, it goes against our spirit, our souls, or whatever you want to call that thing, our energy. And it actually hurts. And that's the rub of all of this, I think. Now, how that plays into it all, I'm not sure, but yeah. The existence is hurtful. Life is hurtful, but you know what? That's it's also good. But it's part of the journey. It's part of what it is. And it was that understanding that that to accept that hurt with everything else in life. Right. Blessed are the women. You know, that the name of that book came from the fact of you know I, I learned to have to understand my my place in my own existence and my own circumstance and i had to forgive a lot and to the things to move on and i had to forgive a lot of people and blessed and the idea of blessed are the wicked was even in the end of all the people that i felt had hurt me all those that hated me and and, and made me go through all of this i had to forgive them and because the the wicked do need blessed. And, and okay. to heal, I had to bless the wicked. So um, that that all came from that death experience in a lot of ways. That's I've been through a lot, my friend. Yeah. Yeah, you have. Um, mm. And it's shaped you, it looks into a really good person that some you. people it destroys. Well, it almost destroyed me. It almost let it destroy me. And I think that was the thing is I understood that I, I couldn't let that happen. I had these, these three human beings to hang on to. And I yeah. had, to, had to get through it for them. That was what was important. Yeah. Uh. Well, you certainly had a fantastic that's not the right word. I tell you, if this jungle rain, when it rains it pours, 
There's no in between. You don't get sprinkles. You get ready. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Well, hopefully, um, the learning continues, but with a a little bit softer rainfall. Um, right. At well, this point, and it seems to be. When the when the learning stops, life stops. Yes. None of us, in, if you embrace that part of yourself, if you embrace the learning part of this, can you allow yourself the ability to be wrong sometimes, the ability, I don't know if we're ever absolutely right, but the ability to do that as well, um, keep yeah. an open mind, and don't follow the pack. You know, keep yourself yeah. open to ideas and things. There's, there's nothing out there that anybody is going to tell you that is any more right or wrong than may, you may feel within yourself. Right. There you go. Exactly. If you're using equipment, learn how to use it and what it is supposed to do. Right. I would suggest that. But otherwise, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, the equipment thing is another thing when you, when you do all yeah. the hour equipment. And, and how I believe that the best equipment you have are or you're sitting, me, myself, and I. I think so. You know. Um, I, I can tell what's there, who's there, communicate, do things that the equipment shows an anomaly. You know, it's funny. Is have you ever been on uh, like a, a research investigation and you're there? And everybody's got their face in chunk. Yeah. And they're looking at this something in their hand, their phone, their, 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 the EMF guy, the boy yeah. EMF meters get to me. It's like, man, I feel so sorry for that person. But <laughs> they're looking at these things and these this, this piece of equipment and they have activity going on all around them and nobody's seeing it because why? Because they got their heads down into these, these gadgets. These gadgets aren't going to tell you any more than you can't tell yourself. Right. They really are. Yeah. They really are, and um, and I think that's that's the thing that's always kind of got to me. You know, it's like open your eyes to the world. Don't don't rely on other things or other people so much that you forget your own voices there and what it can tell you. Right. No, I I agree. Um, sometimes a good digital recorder helps. Just because sometimes you get something that'll show up that way. But um, yeah, basically. Yeah, I'm, I'm by no means telling nobody not to ever use anything, but to use yeah. it responsibly, number one. Number two, to not let that be the end all be all for you. Right. Um, because your experience within the moment and with the place is much more important than what it the gadget's good. The gadget's there to assist you, maybe. It's not there to, to, to give you the answers. The answer's going to be found within, not without. Right. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, I, I like to have communication. I like to interact. I'm, and they've told me we aren't circus animals. We don't perform on demand. Right, mm -hmm. right. And how dare us have the audacity to think that they are. Exactly. Or, and you know, I had him in one of my class tell me this, and I thought I was being really very respectful and explaining that I'm teaching people how to communicate with people like you and such and you know we don't mean to be rude and such and i still got that message and it's like uh oh okay i better clean up my act even more because i try to be more respectful to them even than to the people that are running around breathing um and i try to be respectful usually you get more with sugar than salt <laughs> yeah well, I, I, it's exactly. I, you know, I always try to think. Okay, if, if these things are ancestors, or if these things were people that came before us, 
I always try to put it in the, the sense of if, if this was my my father or my sister or my grandmother or my grandfather, how would I treat them? Yes. And, and that's somebody, the way you should be. And right? if somebody treated my grandmother like they're treating whoever's in that house, they and I would have words and it wouldn't be nice. Right. Um and um no it's and it's their place and we're the ones that are dropping in unannounced and uninvited that's now you know why the book is called the uninvited it's exactly yes. why we were the uninvited they yes. belong here we did yeah and i don't think they're stuck I haven't met one who was stuck yet. Um, that's not a popular opinion to take, but that's okay. I actually, but it's an opinion I agree with. You know, this idea that you that that someone is I, that we could give ourselves the power to go in and just clear all this out. You know, if something is stuck there, it's stuck there because it's their mindset that has got them stuck in a place. Right. You know, I believe the afterlife in this, and I may change my mind on this, but I do believe the afterlife is has a lot to do with our own mindset. If you believe you're going to hell, or you fear hell, you might end up in your own version of hell. Mm -hmm. uh, vice versa. And, uh, you know, it, it's, I don't believe in the two places, by the way. I think we all probably go through pretty much the same place, but I think these right. people that are stuck in this whatever is maybe they're stuck there because they've put themselves there because their own understanding of what death is, is, is kept them there because they're afraid that they're going to go, you know, I give a lot in my life. I'm not proud of I don't want to go there. You know, maybe that's their fear. And I think there has there, there's probably a little truth to that. Maybe. Yeah, and I could see that. Um, but I'm not sure that the soul hasn't gone ahead and gone on where it needs to be anyway. Right. And that's part of the energy and the consciousness maybe of the, the person in their own quandary and dilemma that is it's, here. It's, it's our understanding could be very different than their understanding of what everything is. Yes. Because we don't understand what it is, so therefore, how can we have understanding of it? Right. right. Not really. Yeah. Not really. We try to, but we do our best. That's right. Well, and you know, I've I use my dad as, as an example. He'll pop around sometimes, not very often, but um, if I'm hearing the recording he left behind as we all leave behind um just integrated it's a very different voice and it's a very different way of talking to me and if i'm talking to the soul it's completely different than what's here the soul part has done healing and is more knowledgeable and is softer and um a very different personality in a lot of different ways and um i think so much of what people assume is stuck is just that that part of the human that um worries exactly like you said about those kinds of things and they may express that um but I also, we need to be careful. People say, oh, I got scratched. It has to be a demon. I've got three scratch marks. I usually scratch with three fingers. If you get right. a dog jumping on you, how many scratches are you probably going to get? Three. Um, they didn't, that's not somebody pushing you down the stairs. It's a child trying to give you a hot hug or a dog saying hello. And the help me cry, help me what? Do the dishes? Um, 
and what's the context? What's the place? Um, and um, yeah, it's, we need to be mindful of our own arrogance and our own identity that we place on being the kind of, it goes back to what you were talking about with the addiction mm -hmm. of this is who I am and what I do and making that too much of a of an identity for ourselves and um, I think the saying. thing is is you have to kind of shut yourself off that part of your brain that wants to reason during the experience right. um, too much. It's, you know, it's open your mind to it, actively observe, actively listen, actively participate, um, but be able to separate yourself and this belief structure that you carry with you, the baggage that is you. Um, it's very hard. It's very hard sometimes. Um, but you need to try. You need to try. And, you know, it takes time. Anything like this, it, it takes work. And it takes a lot of self-awareness. Mm. Not to be self-absorbed, but exactly. to <laughs> be aware of who we are and what we're doing and our own strengths and weaknesses. And I'll tell you what, any time... I have thought for a moment that I had it all figured out. They will slap you over the head faster than anything to let you know you do not. Oh yeah. And, and you know, and that's 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 the, the basis of it. And I've seen others where it, it, it always ends badly. It always ends badly for those that think they have the answers and that they're the, the end all to be all. Oh, and, and that that fall for grace could be very hard, can't it? And but it, in, in invariably it happens, and I don't think they're going to pander to it just too much. It's one yeah. way that I think you could get your research to really dry up pretty quick is to close your mind and think you got all the answers. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch. I said, I think, you know, one way to get your research to dry up is to act like you have all the answers. Right. But just quit participating. Right. You know. Well, for one thing, nobody else is going to want to work with you. Well, that's, that's, the, that's the truth, too, as well. Um, yeah. but... My problem is I just got to the point where I can't get people to not follow everyone else. I can't get people to be independent thinkers. You know, that's not, you know, how many times have you, I've been on these, like I used to do these events, I don't do them anymore, um, where I would go and I would speak and the, the investigations and stuff. And you would always see people there and they would always look at you and tell you, well, that's not how they do it on television. Oh. It's like, don't follow that. What do you want to do? How do you think we should do this? Yeah. Be an innovator. And yeah, maybe 80% of what you're going to try is going to fail. But right. out of that 20%, 2% might be brilliance that totally resets our understanding. If there's um, this but there's this fine line you got to walk too, because we were talking about the know-it-all. You can't know it all to innovate. Yeah. You know, you you can't not follow with and be arrogant at the same time about it. I mean, there's, you got to walk this line. It's very difficult sometimes. Uh -huh. And sometimes people understand and misunderstand that is if um, your sharing of your ideas does not mean that you know it all or um, that. But if I if I don't share my ideas, who's going to say, you know, who's going to incite others to share theirs? I think the problem is, is we don't have enough what we're doing right here, conversation. You know, there's got to be more conversation. We, we can't all, you know, get our feathers ruffled every time someone questions something. 
you know. I mean, trust me when I tell you this. I did not come out in this world to tell everyone that two things: that I was a gay man, number one. Number two, that I lived in a haunted house. You know, one thing not everybody's going to like you for sure, and the other thing not everybody's going to believe me. Okay. So you you got to, you know, and that's okay. It's got to be okay because it's the way things are. And, you know, when I, when I came out with the whole to tell people the haunting, you know, my mother actually put it the right way. She said, you know, go out there and tell people your truth. You know, tell them what happened. Don't change it. Tell them exactly the way it happened and what it was and let them take it for what it is. And let them make up their own minds. You know, it's. I think we get in trouble when the person that goes into everything gets this idea that I'm going to tell people that that's the way this was, and I'm not going to listen to anything else. Right. I'm not going to listen to any other ideas. What's interesting, William, if like in in the situation of the haunting, um, you take all of the, my three kids and me, and you put us in a room. We all have different views on it. Oh, I believe it. Yeah, and I fostered that with them, and I and I love the fact that I raised these three individuals who are not afraid to say this is the way I think this is, and this is the way I think this was, because that's exactly what we all should be doing, right? You know, and to, to listen to someone else and and to understand that that other person is not right or wrong for what they think, but. Mm -hmm. There's not enough of that going on, and there's not enough conversation. And I could talk, and I talked, and I talked about it within what they call the paranormal field, which I think it's funny they called it a field to begin with. But, okay, you know, I talked and talked till I was blue in the face that this, you know, we got to, we got to be able to converse. And it was okay to have different ideas. It was okay to be challenging. It was okay not to believe this or that. But to be able to talk about it, but you know what? It just did never happen. Right. It was very. It's very rare. And in circles that it actually happens. You know, the, the the whole thing of these whole events things where they go to they they go to see the same people that talk to them every damn weekend, weekend after weekend, weekend after weekend, and these people are saying the same things, and they're sitting there and they're listening to them, and they never sit there and they never think of for themselves. Because this person is standing there each week telling them what they should think and what they should believe. Mm -hmm. And to me, it just became omnipresently boring. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, <laughs> and, and I was like, I can't do this anymore. I can't do it anymore. Yeah. I don't. Well, I'm lucky I have some, some friends and some people that keep learning and so they'll present something new sometimes right. at a conference and for the most part they're pretty much not saying i'm right anybody else is wrong they're mostly saying this is what i'm finding um and so i've, I've been fortunate about that but i I agree with you for the, you know, it's for the most part, when I am presenting something, I usually include, I don't expect you to believe it just because I'm saying so. Um, exactly. And that's exactly, you know, the, the, my thing was a little bit different, though, than getting up and just giving information because... They never wanted to have this conversation. The conversation they wanted to have is they wanted to stick on that one thing. You yeah. Know, the haunting. And that's what they wanted to, me to talk about week after week after week. And the thing is, is I started looking at people as I was speaking to them. And I realized that, and this was painful. God, I got to tell you it was painful. I realized that I was doing nothing more than being the Saturday matinee at the movies of the, the Haunted House movie. I was okay. more entertainment than I was actually sharing something that was real and that people could learn from. 
And that was hard to, to come to that realization. Right. Because the truth of the matter is, is this that we're doing right now is not something that people are comfortable with enough to do. They just aren't. Well, I think part of it is there's a difference between paranorm the paranormal world, and I'm not disparaging anybody. No, I'm not um, either. Trust me, I'm not. I know a lot of great, great people. And, and I know you aren't. I just, um, I, it's easy for to be misunderstood sometimes for me. So um, I'm really not. But we're talking about uh, the metaphysical world more right. than just the paranormal. Exactly. And the paranormal was part of that gateway in, and part of the manifestation of the metaphysical. And it's that it's that step that gets you here. Yeah, it's not. Right. It's, I'm sorry. Oh. I said it's that step that gets you here. It's the paranormal is the step. It's 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 the entrance or it's the. The, the the doorway that opens up that eventually leads to this. I would hope. I would hope people don't get stuck in that one spot. Right. And you know, for me personally, I on an investigation, if as soon as I run out of, out of entities to talk to, I'm done. <laughs> um, I love looking at the history or looking at the architecture or looking at whatever it is. I mean, I can go on for that for a while, but I've watched doors open and closed and I've seen shadowy figures and I've seen full bodied apparitions and I've had people sit on my bed and feel it go down or the door open and um, different things. And I'm always grateful when they take the time and trouble and energy to do that. But I'm not in it for thrills. Right. Um, and it's like, okay, now let's go have some dinner. Right. <laughs> you know. It's the unintentional research that's the best research. Yeah. When you go out into the world and you're not doing it with the intent of it, um, is when I find that the most amazing life-changing things happen. It's not when I'm looking for it. It's when I'm not looking for it. And I've learned that. I, I'm, and it, it was a matter of just opening myself completely to it and understanding it. And the experience comes from that point, you know? And, and it's not, not something that you can sit down and you can tell somebody how to do necessarily. Right. You know, it's, it's a way of being, it's a way of living. You know, it's a, there's a whole lot of acceptance um, and understanding that had to happen for me to get to this point where I believe I am. You know, it might change. You know, I could. This could be. This is just another step to another another thing or another level of this. And and I'm ready. I mean, for whatever it is, I'm ready for it, and I'm open for it. And, uh, I, and it's been an amazing thing. It started out as a horrible, horrible thing. I gotta tell you, those years were, those first years were rough. And, but I don't regret any of it now. I don't, I, I don't. It made me such the person I am today. And it made me so much better because before that happened, I had lost myself along the way somewhere. And it brought me back to being me. I don't, I don't know how else to say that. It, yeah. It's I'm more of a person now than I was then. More aware of who I am. Yeah. That's what I think. think that's a beautiful way to sum it up. Um, yeah. And we have been live for two hours. It's been a great conversation. It flew by. Thank you. I do too. I'm really thrilled with it, and. Um, I think for the uh, live audience, I'll go ahead and end it. Um, oh, here's Cindy's last. He came to my house that had a lot of activity and helped me understand some of it. 
after his experience. That's Cindy. Paul. Well, that's the important thing, isn't it, William, that we share with others what we learn? Yes. Yeah. And if I'm not helping somebody, why, why even, why, why would I even bother? Exactly. Yeah. Well, that and for my own, my own learning and. Um, heal or heal thyself. Yeah. And I like to meet people and doesn't matter if they have a corporal body or not, you know? So, right. <laughs> well, people, Stephen, I can't thank you enough. This is Well, thank you. Voice. Thank you for spending the time with me. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you for letting me talk on your earphone. Uh, it's a real honor. And uh, we, Katie says, wow, such a grand conversation. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank and you, Katie, for listening. So everybody that's um, been watching or will watch later, I thank you very much. And um, we will be back. Take care, everybody.